So welcome everybody here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY and really thank you for taking time out of your uh, for sure busy, busy lives. It's 4.30 in the afternoon on a great day and everybody is uh, working and out. But we added this uh, next to this great um, panel we're gonna have tonight about the role of uh, female representation, the role of women in contemporary music, which the numbers are extremely low. We still felt since Milo is here we um, will take advantage and uh, talk about his uh, new book, which uh, in Germany, it just came out? Uh, in September, yes. In September, and, and in the evening, Milo will talk about his work. We, we show some excerpts of him, so if you have the time, please do come, and really, it's a fantastic audience. You don't know uh, this group, Milo, so well, but it's a really a fantastic uh, uh, a sample, I think, actually, of New York theater makers and theater goers. So, first of all, Milo, thank you for coming and coming back oh, first time in real life, IRL, as they say here in, at the Siegel Center. <laughs> yes, nice for having me. We had some Zoom talks, no? Many, many Zoom talks, but many we never Zoom met. Talks, but never at life, yes. Yeah, so thank And you arrived on Sunday? Uh, we arrived on Sunday late night, and uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, we had this presentation of the, of the Academy uh, Second Modernism, and today I'm here, and tomorrow we leave. And tomorrow he's even, so he's staying just for you guys um, and to share his work yes. and his insights. And, um, and I really would like uh, to say what you already know, but uh, Milo is an artist, a theater artist, and he's a great artist. And um, his work uh, is influential. It's highly interesting. It has changed the way we look at theater. And if we do uh, see and with how many people work in the world of theater and do great work, you know, we all um, acknowledge and, it, um, and that um, a work that has uh, an impact. And uh, many do say that uh, after the uh, political work of Brecht or Piscator, perhaps in a way of also, also Mnuchkin or others, but this is uh, at the moment um, um, approach, an idea, an exploration, you know, that is the most significant and something we have to think about. If we do theater, if we write about theater, if we go to theater, Milo um, created a world, he found answers or found more questions, but perhaps the right questions, and he will luckily um, share uh, with us a little bit the book, um, which is about to be translated by Lily, is she here? Uh, how oh, here you are, right, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and um, it will come out when? <laughs> yeah, but this year, uh, this year, not the beginning of next year, um, and, um, and also uh, Jay is here from the Skirball who will present Milo perhaps next year, spring, October this year. Yes. Um, um, so, um, so you also will um, um, have um, some, um, some context. So, um, Milo, uh, tell us first, why, why did you write the book? <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I wrote many books. That's book number 20. Um, you and have your own publishing house, right? Sorry? You have your own publishing house. No, 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 no. Some people think that, but it's, 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 I did the, 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 the book uh, were, were, were printed in many different houses. Antigent had some? Ah, Antigent, yeah, the golden books, that's true. Books, yeah. The golden books, but it's not my publisher, we just had one line in this publishing house, uh, which is a German publisher, the Verbrecher Verlag, which is a very nice publisher. So this was published by Rowold. And it was for me interesting as a structural uh, thinker to see that when I published it in Robert, which is the biggest German publishing house, how many copies were distributed and how few copies when I did it in Verbrecher Verlag, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's always, I mean, I made 20 books, but I think Lily can uh, tell you a story about it. It's always uh, more or less the same content, um, just in different <laughs> books. <laughs> And so this is the newest one, and it was uh, it already had three editions at that moment in Germany. It's now translated in some some languages in French and Italian and Croatian. You know, we have all these languages in in Europe, and um, uh, and in Dutch. And um, um, the book was uh, was was inspired by the fact that I was uh, invited by by Zurich, which is one of my my hometowns in Switzerland to have the, what is called at the university there, the poetic lectures. And the poetic lectures, they normally give them to writers, 
but they made an ex I don't know an exception for me because I'm not a I'm not a writer I'm a I'm a I don't know an activist a director I, uh, whatever um, and then I was speaking in three lessons about my work so everything I I I, I tell here is based on on projects I did the first part is very biographical so I ask myself how did I come to where I am now um, why didn't I become a writer or whatever a sociologist why why uh, uh, ended I in in theater or in film um, and in part two and three so that's the past then we go into the present so what kind of uh, experiences are uh, were important for me and I talk about people I met so I made in, in Russia a project together with uh, at that time completely unknown punk group uh, Pussy Riot uh, that's why I lost the visa in 2013 in, in Russia we made a a nice project together. All the people I met in in uh, in the in the east of Congo when we did the Congo Tribunal. So an advocate who is dead now, um, or Yvon Sani. I think we had one talk yes. uh, with Yvon Sani, yes. who is uh, an activist from Cameroon, who in the south of Italy uh, was playing the main role uh, in my in my Jesus film that we will, I think, partly project this evening. Um, and in the second part, I talk about people that were important to me and always trying to find out why theater and uh, which is by the way the title of another book uh, I did <coughs> and and because you meet people so I think you said that you produced the first play by Rune Polesz who is a, a German uh, director writer um, very influential to my generation by the way um, and he he wrote one text in in my book why theater I invited around 110 makers from the whole world and um, um, and he said if I'm alone I can't think so you need somebody you would speak to you need a question you need a situation Aki Kawis Mackie which is another director who, who was quite influential from Finland to me he said uh, he wanted to become a writer but then when he was at the table he couldn't find anything but then when he comes into a room and then there are 30 people there 20 people waiting that something happens, there's a situation, uh, he would start to think and he would start to interact and something would be created and nobody knows from where it comes. And this is the, I wanted to write a poetology about how this functions, how out of meetings you would create, um, I call these microecologies. How is this actually working? And the third part is then asking, okay, of course we are interacting all the time and we normalize, as we know now as a civilization, deadly ways of interacting, which are not made for life, but made for doom. So how can we um, develop together other ways of interacting? And there my basic idea is that I base myself again on, uh, on, on, on meetings to write this third uh, part. I did a, a kind of a, an activist piece in Switzerland to um, bring back a mummy that was stolen from Egypt in the 19th century during colonialism and to bring it back together with a group of 100 Egyptian uh, scientists, uh, which is in the, in the main cathedral of my hometown, Switzerland. It's very known, this mummy. Um, and how to bring it back uh, using all kind of different ways of interacting in our society. And based of on this action, I try to to describe how we can create unforeseen collectives to find other ways of constructing society, of producing goods, of producing art, of course, of of having relations of all kinds. Um, and and to end this this little introductory monologue, because I think that you have no idea about what I do. So um, I think that my whole work is based on finding strange contexts for stories we we know so bringing for example the bible to the south of italy and i mixed actors from because i, I was invited by 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 matera the city what which was the uh, european capital of culture i was invited to do whatever i want and i answered them i want to do a jesus film because this is uh, the city where you know, Pierpaolo Pasolini and uh, yeah, Mel Gibson, they did their 
Passion of the Christ, uh, the second, uh, uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew, um, these two films. So I phoned to the Jesus of Enrique Razzocchi of Pasolini and to the Holy Mary of Mel Gibbs, Maya Morgenstern, people I knew from other projects, and I said, I want to do a Jesus film in Matera. And they said, okay, let's go there again. So Enrique was not there again since the film, and the same with Maya Morgenstern. She had a very bad experience with Mel Gibson because, uh, uh, you know, this film for her as a Jewish actor was a bit difficult. So we went back, and then we found a situation which you call, could call ironic because the capital of culture in Europe is surrounded by uh, uh, wild refugee camps of people exploited by the mafia who work on the fields to produce tomatoes who are exported to Africa to destroy the agriculture in Africa and then the people come to work here as slaves and not here but in Europe. But I guess we have the same situation in the in the fields in the US, um, like like in like in Europe or in Spain or in Italy, in Germany, everywhere. Um, and uh, and then we decided to find a Jesus that is from these, because we wanted to have a big Italian actor in the beginning. And then I told him, uh, okay, you will, you will now be Pontius Pilatus, and we have to find Jesus. And then we started to find Jesus, and we found uh, Yvon Sagnier, who is a very impressive uh, activist. I, w I, I write a lot about him in this book. He was a farm worker, um, and he made the first strike against the mafia, which is uh, deadly in this part of Italy, but he survived. He could uh, change the law. Of course, this law was never adapted. Um, and I met him and I said, okay, Yvon, um, how did you do this? Because you know, um, capitalism loves identity politics. So when you go on the fields, they would say, you are Romanian, you can't work together with uh, guy from Nigeria, you are from Nigeria, you can't work together with somebody from Cameroon, you are from Italy, you are from whatever, you are a sex worker, you are a farm worker, and they don't unite. And I said, but how did you do it to connect people? And he said, I, s I, I searched sub-leaders from all communities, I had 12 sub-leaders. And I said, oh, Jesus had also 12 sub-leaders. So let's do it like him. And then we started to do this project together. And that's how the idea of, of doing um, the new gospel was born. And um, in this book, I try to, to understand how this, how this functions, um, uh, this, this way of, 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 uh, of experience and of, uh, because what we then did, um, you just interrupt, Frank. Um, what we then did, we said, okay, we can't do a Jesus film without changing the way how films are done, done and how the people that are working in this film who are illegal farm workers, legalized by European politics, um, um, can change the situation. And then we created together with the, with the Catholic Church, by the way, um, um, we gave them contracts. And with these contracts, uh, Yvon Sanier, uh, who is an intellectual and activist, started to produce tomatoes. And by giving them contract producing tomatoes and through the film as a propaganda material, we found like around 150 supermarkets to distribute the tomatoes. The people started to buy these tomatoes. The money went there. And now Yvon is around 1,200 people that already have contract and are legalized by entering the market, because you have in the, in the European asylum law, you have this, of course, this absurd catch-22 situation. If you don't have a working contract, you can't have, uh, uh, you can't be legalized. If you are not legalized, you can't have a working contract. So you have to go out by getting uh, a work contract anyway. And, and that's, that's how we use the film project to to, to, to change the, the, the situation of these people that were in the, in the beginning playing extras in the film. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant um, example of your work. Um, Milo started out as a journalist, by the way, um, as Remini Protocol often refer themselves also as journalists. Um, this is a work um, where I think he puts into practice um, what his ideas also in the book are about. He's a philosopher, if you read the book, uh, he's incredibly well read, he went to the Sorbonne, um, he's an intellectual and also someone who is able 
also happy to talk about his work, which I think is very significant and, and important. That's why also feel you're right at home here. Milo, you say um, we have to go out, and this is a radical example of it. We have to leave the safe spaces. The safe spaces, which you actually say in the theaters, they're like the minute differences where people are fighting each other, pretending there is no real outside world, like on identity politics or other things, but he says ignoring the real, the horror and the brutal brutality of a naked capitalism, as you said. So we have to go out. You say the uh, new philosophies will not come in the rehearsal rooms. They will not come from literature houses. They will not come from university. They come from the forests, from the banlieues, from the refugee camps. And um, it's a radical idea, of course. So tell us a bit more of what you say. We have to leave the place where we are in order to be part of change or be change. Um, when, when, when you look at the literature of the Ancien Regime, before democracy was created, you have in a France, yeah. in France, you have a quite interesting play by, by Molière, Les Femmes Savantes, uh, which is about a group of very sensitive ladies. And these ladies in a salon in Paris under Louis, Se no, Louis XIV in the time of, of Molière, so in feudal times, create a salon where they have a kind of a safe space where they have purified rhetorics. They don't use anything that could be assaulting sexually. They don't talk about poverty. They are, they are super sensitive and they are kind of exclu exclude themselves from reality. But of course they can do it because they can pay their sensitivity because they are the, l the ruling class of this time. Um, and I think we, 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 we try to normalize all of us the, this kind of situation. So we try to, 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 to not confront ourselves to what you call the, the naked uh, capitalism. I think it was, uh, it's a, a quote by Karl Marx. He said, if you want to know, if you want to see the naked capitalism, go to the colonies. And of course, today, these are the ex-colonies. It's the banlieues, because we have inside our societies colonies. As I said, you go outside the capital of culture of Europe, and you find half a million of illegalized slaves. And they say slaves because they are legally slaves, they have no name, they are not legalized, if they disappear, they disappear. They are, as uh, I think in the antiquity you said, they are machines used by capitalism, that's what it is. Um, and I think that if we are racist, it is based on the reality we created, because we live together with people or we live from people that we treat like machines, and that's why there is racism. And I think overcoming racism is only by connecting this two dots of the reality, you know? I, I, I did an opera in, in Geneva a, a week ago, um, or 10 days ago, Justice, uh, which was a Congolese-European co-production uh, about the mining industry in the Congo. And the interesting fact is that Eastern Congo is the most, the, the richest country in, in raw materials, so in, in cobalt, in, in, uh, in gold, in, uh, in copper, um, and coltane, and, and so on. And, but these raw materials have no value in the, in the Eastern Congo. But when you bring them to Switzerland, they raise their value like 40, 50 times. And that's the richness of Switzerland. So these are two parts of the planet directly connected. So the reality of Switzerland is Congo and the reality of Congo is Switzerland. And you can't read Switzerland without reading Congo and you can't live Switzerland without living in Congo. So there is only a project that says the reality about Switzerland is a collective made of Congolese and Swiss artists and activists. And they can tell a story about the reality because there are two parts and none of these parts is the whole reality. And, and, and that's what we try to do. And as you say, so exposing yourself to another reality is not that you go there and you watch and then you would learn. It's that you make a project together with a group of people that is completely connected to another reality. And sometimes, let's say in the methodology of liberation, they are of course much further than the Europeans because when you are rich, you don't need to change your way of living, you know? You will be the last one to change. So the French Revolution was not done by the ruling class, of course, because they had no interest in, in, in changing the situation. So les femmes savantes, they would even today continue to talk about their sensitivities, you know? They will forever do that. And um, 
a project that for me was formative, and I think that's the one we bring to to New York is the is the is the Antigone in the Amazon project where I met um, the landless movement, or we were in in uh, in, uh, in Brazil and we showed some plays, and the plays were forbid to to tour, and then the landless movement. Uh, came to us and they said, why would we not do a project together? Because they were, perhaps you know Augusto Boal in your studies. I met him, yeah. Ah, yeah. So the, uh, one of his dramaturgs, and, uh, and they said, let's, let's work together. And then we decided to use Antigone and to, to make workshops in the very north of... of and Brazil. the landless movement, just to explain, if I understand right, is uh, people who were supposed to get land back through government uh, exchange, after also dictatorships, who never ever got it, occupied it and created a, a, a sensational uh, infrastructure to better their lives in a community, it, y you say almost like a, a Paris Commune uh, a sense. Just to sort of M much bigger huh, than the Paris Commune. So there are like 100,000 of families, millions of people. Uh, and when you go there, you will find the nation inside the nation. It's a bit like when, when, when the French Revolution happened, they created a parliament and they said, they invented the word of nation and they said, we are the nation. If you want to be part of the nation, join us. And it's really the civil society kind of creating what you call the commune with all sorts of, 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 of departments in it. So they have independent schools, they have independent uh, everything, legal systems, theaters, etc. By occupying land, they create the nation inside the nation, bigger than I mean, Belgium, for example. So really very impressive. So I was, I was uh, of course, a bit uh, scared when they, they invited us to do th that, but um, and then we started to to work together, and 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 that's what I tried to in the second part of the book to more or less to tell also the story of this um, of this meeting of how, for example, if theater is not in you know in Europe theater is very much in is is an institution, so you would do a school. When you come from a certain class, you would do a school, and then you go from that school, you go to make plays, different from society, different a bit from the milieu you come from, but normally you would stage the, the big classics, and you would deconstruct it in the 90s, and you would do it in a very realistic way in the zero years, and, and you know. And today you would talk about gender, and in 20 years, the I don't know, the elite will, will have another approach to it. But it's really the, it's, it's just the same again and again and again. And when you go to the landless movement, you see, okay, this is a tool of life. This is a tool of common understanding of what should be done. This is a, it's a way, for example, the use of, uh, I wrote another text about the use of the choir, uh, which is uh, in Europe lost. In Europe, there is the use of the choir as a more or less technical thing you do in, 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 in acting schools. So you would talk in a rhythm, but for example, the landless movement, uses the choir for demonstrations, of course. So they learn to talk in a choir in school and they learn how the choir is a way of liberate every individual act together. But for example, for me, decision-making is super interesting with the, with the landless movement because you would fight and go through everything because it's not that that kind of, of decision-making means that uh, individual uh, opinions are not represented, but at one point they would act. And and we use the choir, or we learn to use the choir in Antigone, in a, which has this very known choir of men is monstrous, nothing is as, as monstrous as men, and all these this incredible sentences in the beginning of the capitalist society, already knowing that um, what will happen to all of us. and. Uh, and to read this in the north of Brazil, in the Amazon, together with them, to create a new version of Antigone, uh, gave back the meaning of it. So kind of, you know, giving these texts a bit back to where they somehow belong to. We you rewrote the ending. And we rewrote the ending, because when we arrived, um, um, you know, the tragic mind is a suicidal mind, meaning that sometimes I was asking myself, I, Shilos, and all the others, didn't they know how to end play? Because normally just everybody suicides. I mean, you have a bit the same with Chekhov, of course, and even with Shakespeare. 
and perhaps it's really the tragic mind is something very Western that the idea that you you fight and if you this kind this idea of the hero and you 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 you, you can survive in the end you know and that was happening to Antigone and to Hymon and to, 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 to the half of the of the and when we were reading it together with this group of of, uh, uh, of people from the landless movement they said but we are Marxists we would never suicide this makes complete is, is nonsense this is a story that makes no sense and uh, and then of course we we wrote what we call the sixth act uh, yeah but you should see the play because yeah. it's it's very we hopefully track, so. luckily we will um, just to repeat and I think it's the same what you say about European theater is also for here you go to a university you're lucky if you don't have to pay ninety thousand dollars a year to be allowed to study art um, um, and then you try, you write a play at home or with some friends, and you try to get it in a theater, or maybe even commercial, you try to get backers or some others decide it gets in or not, and then you hire actors in a certain rehearsal time, it gets done. Of course, downtown theaters work differently, luckily here, but still the model, what you have, wh who's running a national theater, a big theater, a stop size theater, to say, we don't have to do it in our space. We can do our work in Italy. Um, we bring some of our actors, but we have an activist. We have film actors from different, you know, generations. Um, we react to the place where we are. We look um, and um, and create something in the space that has a clear, I would say, political, unapologetically political message. The idea, not only it's not enough uh, to uh, show what is wrong in the operation saying, not only it's enough, you know, to call for action, I think your theater and what you say is you actually have to be part of the action. You have to leave something um, that uh, in that stays when you go. Um, I think it's an extraordinary um, um, approach, and I can only imagine how complex um, um, that um, uh, really is. So um, my question um, for you is: um, Do you think? that your theater is changing? Are you part of change or you're reflecting a change that's already going on, that is already happening? You say in your book that the time of criticizing is over. It's time of the revolt. It's time of doing things differently. So uh, how do you see your theater? Um, I mean, there's this, this film, Swiss filmmaker who also suicided uh, some months ago, uh, Jean-Luc Godard. Um, who was living close to Geneva and made a, a lot of films, and um, and he he said, you can't just do another film. By doing a film, you have to change the way how films are made. So you have to change the way of producing and the state the the way of distributing art. And I think this structural approach that he and perhaps his whole generation we talk about the the early sixties. Uh, brought to the table to say we are not representing anymore what Chekhov did is beautiful but now it's about changing reality changing um, the ideas of course they were very much influenced by the by the style of their time by Maoism by co collectivism by by communism and so on um, and 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 today it's 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 of course different so I I try in every project I do to create what I called before the uh, microecology, so a way how the people involved in a project would use this project to become producers themselves. So as an example, um, when we did Orestes in Mosul, so Mosul, uh, the, the capital of the Islamic State for uh, a certain time Iraq, in, yeah. in Iraq, north of Iraq, close to Kurdistan, um, we made with the Arts Academy a play called Orestes in Mosul and we toured it in Europe, but we knew that for them, whatever they produce in theater, it will never be possible to tu tour because there are no institutions and they will never get a visa to go outside Iraq because Europe says, sorry, uh, if, you, if we give you a visa, you will disappear immediately and then we have more illegal immigrants. That's, that's what is, so it was impossible to get visa for them. So we said, uh, and at the very same moment, the UNESCO, the cultural branch of the United Nations, they came to us and said, you were in Mosul, um, and uh, 
he would like to to create or to recreate <coughs> what they call immaterial heritage because the whole city was destroyed but all the institutions were destroyed too and then we said okay if you give us the money we would like to create together with the arts academy of mosul uh, a film school and to bring all the tools to make films there and then we started producing films and then we started distributing these films on european festivals and these films were of course wonderful we were talking about pier paolo pasolini which were so wonderful and strong films in the 50s in italy because italy was destroyed and all the actors they didn't have any actors anymore because they were all fascists and they couldn't work anymore so they worked with non-professionals you know and then they created this incredible style of of european art house movie which we have still today just because out of of the ruins of the second world war and out of the ruins of Mosul they created a style I was looking like this and I was saying that this is incredible so now I understand why we still do films in Europe because they do really why they need this tool and I also found out that you can learn what we know as filmmakers in three months so in three months they were as professional as I am you know they just didn't have the tools and they didn't have the distribution ways and when you give them these possibilities they can they can do what they want and uh, and, and 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 for me this was the meaning of doing orestes in mosul of course i have my as a as an artist i have or as, as a i don't know as a light designer as a technician etc i have my own little nerdy obsessions so i would always do this kind of political melodramas which you like or don't, but I try to do more than this uh, around it. Um, um, and, and, and this was the reason why we were talking about the, 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 the Theatre of Ghent, or now uh, we are in the Vienna Festival, which is a, a big crossover festival in Europe. Uh, which so the artistic director since a year, right? From since the year. Vienna Festival, a very insignificant thing like the Avignon Festival. Um, yeah, it's one of the of the of of the big festivals. And the interesting thing of the Vienna Festival is that um, Vienna is full of institutions and full of history, and is the capital of modernism, which connected, of course, to the Academy Second Modernism, because it was a yeah. But that's perhaps for the second second panel. <laughs> um, and uh, at one point, I understood it's it's interesting to enter institutions and to change the institutions because these institutions pray you know produce um art art is not coming from i mean theater art of course writing you can do outside institutions but theater is in the end of the day very much in europe made by the big institutions so when you go into a national theater to to lead it like in in, in uh, we did in ghent so then you have three or four big halls and then you program these halls and then you bring what was in the little black box to the main stage and then you change the ensemble which was formed of kind of the all the stars of the dutch and uh, flemish theater you change it to what you described as a crazy mix what we call the global ensemble of people that have all kind of of backgrounds and start to produce a popular art another art that interests everybody in the city or this group and that group and so on and um, and and then you start to tour or then you start to say okay one of the production it was even a rule we did in in Ghent one of the productions you have to do outside a theater for example Orestes in Mosul Antigone in the Amazon or the Jesus film in in a in Italy um, to to create infrastructure where there is not and um, and um, and these are decisions i think you can i mean this is my decision and it has not to be the decision of, of every artist and i don't try to pray the this kind of structural approach in my book um, but i i uh, i think at this very moment you know we come out but this is a european story uh, of a very long phase of la pour la of a very long phase of deconstruction of a very long phase of irony and minimal dissent and you know this kind Humanism, of yeah yeah voila and uh, i felt at one point the kind piece of this this modernist constructive need to say what is an institution what is a popular theater um in the 21st century in a globalized world what what 
who who are the actors what are the topics what it means to 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 stage a classic today you know um and uh, who can give meaning to this to these classics how can a global realism be constructed who has to work together to talk on the level of global economy for example how can you tell the global fi finance market what is what are the words you know and um and uh, and the collectives and what is the public and um and and uh, yeah and for to to find this i need needed to invade institutions at one one point like six seven eight years ago um a bit by accident and um and since then i'm i'm very much in interested by by voila by by institutional work somehow yeah and i think what is uh, so remarkable and i think i just even you said i would like to repeat it again that Milo says we do live comfortable lives but the brutality of the world is there. We don't see it. Perhaps we don't see the bonlieus. We don't see them where they are in New York or as you said in Madeira, but they are in the South, in the global South. And I think he says we have to leave those spaces where we are in. We have to go to these spaces. We have to not just bring them to us. We have to go and we have to listen. He says one of his big chapters is Hör zu, which means really um, listen um, to what the world um, has to say and um, and to uh, interact uh, with it. It's not only uh, um, a suggestion. He says we um, do have the obligation to do that. It's a it's an important radical matter. And you still also makes great, great, great theater. We all know that ideology normally doesn't make great theater. I don't think Milo's pieces are ideological. They are chaotic. Um, they are uh, well thought through. They have a dramaturgy, but they're also open. You will see. It's 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 a sensational. I think it was very important comment. Um, yeah. When when perhaps when you ask why writing books, uh, why doing campaigning so much, why uh, working in institutions, why working together with activists, that I I mean what you said that I think there are things that you have to export from art. And when I when I when I'm teaching at universities, what I do less and less. But what I I always said to the to the directors or the actors or the stage designers, perhaps you learn stage designing or you are an actor, but every project needs another tool. Perhaps it's a book, perhaps it's a film, perhaps it's a campaign, perhaps it's a play. But when you decide to do a play and you see that there is a lot of things in it that is ideological teaching, and you feel the need then write a manifesto, write a book, you know? Sometimes you don't have to pack everything into the play. And that's the reason why I started writing books, that I can kind of bring this into books, or that I started to create institutions to bring it into institutions. Um, when we did Antigone and the Amazon, which is an activist play, uh, but the, the real activism we did in, the, in, the, in, the, in a campaign, so uh, this, again, screenwashing campaign, because of all the European and North American uh, big companies that are destroying the Amazon, they found out that they use the word sustainable and diverse, but they are not diverse and not sustainable. And if in the Amazon somebody hears the word diversity or sustainability, they run because they know they will be killed by the white man because these are the new terms of capitalism. And uh, <laughs> I remember that we had the, the term sustainable in the first manifesto and Alton Krenak, who is a bit the, the leading philosopher, let's say, from uh, indigenous Brazil, we had to, to, to throw this term out of it because he hates that. And, um, and, and it was this, I mean, all the things to learn that what we think is, is right to do is, 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 is deadly for others. So that's the, that's the point. I, I had, I, you wanted that I read out a little part, and perhaps you can take this one. It's a bit a complex one, but uh, I can... We are at the university, that's a <laughs> Why not? So I quote Bourdieu and Nikolai Bukharin, and voila. But uh, if that's absolutely unclear, you will explain everything, I think, yeah. Frank. I know that. So the, the, it's, the, it's the pound number uh, three, and there uh, you have the rules of the coming uprising. Um, and the third rule is you are the problem. Um, 
this point can be summarized relatively easily with simple uh, one-liner. So I'm, I'm discovering the translation of, of Lily. <laughs> Never make a project that doesn't also implicate yourself. Recently, um, perhaps one word of the Congo Tribunal, it's a tribunal we did with, with, because I'm talking about this now in the next lines. It's a project we did in the east of Congo together with uh, advocates from from uh, from Congo and from Europe uh, to put in trial the big uh, European companies. For example, Glencore, the opera is about Glencore too, the biggest uh, raw material company of the world, which is a Swiss company. Um, but there is no, I mean, the, the, the strange fact is that we have, uh, uh, we have a globalized uh, economy or a global economy, but we don't have a global economic economical law or tribunal, it doesn't exist. So whatever they do in the east of Congo, there is no possibility for the people thrown from their lands, from the victims of whatever, uh, to put them on trial. That's why together with, with the, the House of Lawyers of, of Congo, we created what we call the Congo Tribunal, and we did a film about it, and it exists since 10 years. We showed it, yeah. And you showed it, ah, okay, cool, yeah, I remember. Recently, a group of activists reproached me in an open letter stating that the Congo Tribunal was, in truth, little more than an act of appropriation. How could I presume to be able to talk about the problems of the Congolese, about their misery, about their problems, to, in a manner of speaking, steal their thunder? That's right. Why do I do this? I don't believe that the effect that the Congo Tribunal, as in every respect, collectively developed global or at least the national project is sufficient. The principal investigators are Congolese and the jury a kind of chambre mixte consisting of national, so Congolese and international, mostly Belgian and Swiss lawyers and NGOs. This has been the case in all four major installations of the Congo Tribunal since 2015. At the last tribunal, which was in December 2021, organized, filmed, and staged by a Congolese production company at the Parliament of Colvesi, the world capital of Cobalt, I only sat in the, in the jury. But this is just one point, because the latter means something else with the word appropriation, maybe something like this. The consequence of a crime, whatever, whatever they may be, belong to the victims, not the perpetrators. And the perpetrators, as members of a group, are responsible, not in a subjective sense, for this crime. This is, of course, a very Bourdieuian concept, because on the one hand, it is based on the idea of symbolic possession, and on the other, on a collective idea of history and historical action. Someone who understood this painful objectivity of circumstance was Nikolai Bukharin, the most brilliant intellectual of early state communism. He was charged in one of the most absurd trials in world history, the so-called Third Moscow Trials of 1937. The accusations brought against him, collaboration with fascism, plans to overthrow Stalin and so on, are so utterly laughable that they are not even worth mentioning. Not least because they were brought Stal by Stalin, who just a few years later would himself enter into a pact with Hitler. Naturally, Bukharin denied the accusations articulated in this memorable utterance, subjectively speaking, I am innocent, but objectively, I know that I am guilty. Because as a political cater, he was partly responsible for the deaths of millions in the civil war, for the great Ukraine famine, for the misguided foreign policy of the etc., etc., etc. So what I want to say here is that objectively, as the ruling class, here in the US, in, in Europe, we are guilty anyway. So what is our possibility of collaborate with the Congolese mining workers, for example? And, and that's what I tried to develop in this third rule. Yeah. And I, I think um, your theater clearly shows that we are implemented. And actually, I think Carol Martin wrote that in her piece in TDR about you, where she said, why your theater is so fascinating that the viewer even gets implemented watching the interviews you know for the way for the acting so that you also um, uh, are able to um, stage the um, contradictions uh, we live in the uh, worlds that don't really meet that we live perhaps as you write we try to live the right life in the wrong life in the wrong age um, 
So it's it it is a, a really um, I think um, a, an attempt, as he said, to radically demonstrate what's wrong um, um, in the world to um, really uh, have a fundamental difference with what is what is accepted as something that cannot be changed for a moment on stage. Um, there's so, so much more we can talk about, but I think one of the interesting, I think very surprising um, uh, things in your book, you open up with uh, quoting the four writers of the apocalypse. And um, you write about the pitfalls in a way for making art. When you make art, what are the complications? And what do we have to think about? What do we have to take into account? And I think you give some help of the way. The apocalypse, in the Greek sense, um, once was on the panel, is actually that it reveals something. It comes only like the eucalyptus plant, but apo means it opens something. It was not just uh, the apocalypse, the, the kind of doomsday apocalypse. It means also the d revelation um, 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 of something. But uh, so um, maybe um, we don't have to go through all the the five one, you, you, you added another writer, as you call them, but tell us a little bit um, um, what you think we have to be careful for and what you learned in your work, how we can um, avoid these writers, which is a very uh, a, a surprising and I think interesting, great opening. Yeah, the, the, the first the first, it's, it's the first chapter, actually, what I call the uh, biographical approach for my generation, uh, which somehow invented what we call today the I identity politics or the deconstruct, de deconstruction of what was before. Like, you know, um, I think the generation before us, um, I don't know, they, 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 uh, thought humanity from objective forces, you know? I was talking about Bukharin, which is of course very far away, but um, which class do you belong to? And how this class can be organized that you overthrow, uh, for example, the, the ruling class? How would you take state power? How would you use the term of heroism to adapt it to a si little group of guerrillas and so on and so on? So very much is somehow very, you know, very uh, old European style of thinking the world that was exported in the colonies and used by Che Guevara and all these figures. And then came a generation, it was, it was even not my generation, but it was the generations of my professors that everything we did when we studied and I was in school and I started, finally I, I started this quote, I started to go to high school in 89 so when the, the wall fell in, in, in Germany, so the Cold War was over. And I was finishing my studies in 2001 when here the, uh, the attack happened. And uh, in these years, so what was called the years of the end of history before another history started in 2001, um, it was this kind of deconstructed times. So I remember that when we were staging Shakespeare, it was deconstructing Shakespeare. When we were uh, talking, uh, I don't know about philosophy, then we were talking about how the rhetorics of philosophy don't talk about reality and reality is not touchable. I remember that when we, when we studied, the professors were saying, uh, what you learn is not, are not facts and is not acting, it is how you have approach to information and what you do is collect the information. Mm -hmm. And when we were writing articles, we had to collect information. I, I make one chapter about when I wrote my first seminary in, uh, in, in, in Paris, and it was about the, the, about the use of subtitles in the films of, of Godard. So very specific, absurd things. And uh, we had a lot of moral discussions about it. So it was this time when we started to, to question the canon. And I think all these things were super, super important, but I describe how this whole action was leading um, to this situation that I, 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 I described in the, in the, in the Femme Savante by Moliere, that the ruling class was created that was only interested in their own sensitivities and in their own knowledge and in their criticism of almost everything. And, and uh, uh, in this book, I, I in the first chapter, I described this 
this movement and then the four riders or the five i don't remember it's one is over information yeah say some, something about over information you think this is one of the complications of our time yeah of course i mean i i describe where i i, I read hundreds of articles to write a little article about godard and in the end i start criticizing the articles because i I, I'm, I'm kind of paralyzed in this, in, this, in this action of reading all these articles. So another one is, I think, moralization. Another one is, I don't know the trans translations, perhaps you wrote yeah, it down. You say critique, the critiquing. Of course, since we are the university, I, I liked what you wrote. I thought, made me really think, tell us a bit um, your critique of critique, where you say, why is it complicated? Why is it standing in the way of acting? I mean, you, you always have times of, I mean, the, the, the very old book I, 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 I wrote was, was called What Has to be Done, Critique of Postmodern Reason. And I do a bit the same, like in the first chapter here, uh, to talk about a certain time in intellectual history of the West, to say, okay, there was the time when we deconstructed what we called objectivity, what we called uh, social class, what we called even the socialism in itself, and everything was deconstructed. Gender was, of course, deconstructed, and it was good to do so. But what comes next? What kind of collect collectivity can be reconstructed out of all this? How can civil society, what, which was completely deconstructed, of course, by liberalism, but also by trying to emancipate all the minorities how can can there be a collective force again and that's why then after this the second chapter comes and i i start meeting people and movements that are already i mean the landless movement is three generations ahead to the european left you know because they occupy and not like some students that occupy a house and make a big story out of it they occupy land they create a na nation you know they produce, they're the biggest producer of rice of Latin America. So this is really a, but in a biological sense, and, uh, and, and, and to learn from these collectivities, because when you then look at the landless movement, you have um, many people coming from, I don't know, people like us, from the white middle class, from the cities, then you have people from the black movement, then you have people that is uh, interested, that is from the indigenous movements, and, and they all came together to create out of this, this difference is a new collective mind. And how does this work in a not destructive sense? How can this, this, this kind of, you know, identity politics bring it together with, uh, uh, with, a, with a Marxist idea of becoming I don't know, ruler of your own history altogether. The idea of the choir is very much based for me in this, this idea, how can you bring all the identities together to have one voice at a certain point when you need it and then you don't need it anymore for another moment and you don't, don't use it and then you need it again. So how would this shift in between identity and collectivity work, you know? And uh, what is the way of living and what is the, the rhetorics and um, what are the institutions we need? Yeah, and so I think your 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 call out uh, very loudly is to say we have to uh, be part. We have to change the world, and just to think we critique the world, and then we exchange our critiques. What does you think? What does he say? So a critique between critiques is not changing anything. It's now it does not leave any trace. Um, there has to be uh, something um, radically different. And then you, I think, I like very much also the, uh, your thoughts on the morality. He says the complexities you know we are encountering in the world of art by souls in writing for universities that you say, you know, there is um, um, a pitfall, you think there. You're right now going also through it in your work. So tell a little bit, because I think also for the American context, it is of significance what you say. Um, I mean, there's a, there's in, in sociology, there is a, um, there's a rule that the less, for example, inside a society, the society there are differences the more you would feel every difference the less you are the more you are in a group where everybody is the same you would feel the little difference in this group so you are a bit older than me you are i don't know coming from another part of the german speaking world you have a, and so on and then we could moralize it and we could start to discuss it because we stay in this little group you know 
and you don't open it anymore. And I think that is what happening, what is happening in a lot of parts of, of, of our institutions, of our uh, uh, of our way of living, and perhaps always always was. I, I, I don't know how much this is this is this is only for now. And um and so my, my, my question always was how can we open it in a way that we don't do that anymore? that we don't search for these pure spaces where we meet the same people to then find out that we are different at all. You know, how can we produce art out of difference? How can we not make a problem out of it, but, but really say, okay, we are in the end of the day confronted with the same problems. And I think this is the, this is the, the big question since, since, not 89, perhaps since 1960, perhaps even since Stalinism, perhaps since the Second World War, perhaps even before, perhaps communism was always only a crazy idea and never happened and the class never existed. But the big question of humanity was always how can we understand ourselves and perhaps even further than humanity when you think with Ivan Krenak who thinks the whole living system of the planet as one uh, big complex, but one big network how can we start to act and to understand how this whole thing works? How can we overcome, I don't know, individualism and, I mean, mass movements were more or less multiplicative individualisms. So how can we overcome this? How can this, this, this change? And I think this is the, um, this is the question that was, was, was asked after the construct, you know, was at that, yeah, so this is this is the. Um, I I told you that I I had in my festival this little uh, problem. Let's say the last days, <laughs> that I uh, I wanted to do a a project with with uh, Ukrainian and Russian um, artists, and uh, it was problematized in such a fight. There is a war, as you know, in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, and the whole west of Europe is for uh, mostly for Ukraine, uh, for good reasons, because it's an invasion. And Vienna is very close to Ukraine. So, um, um, and it's full of Ukrainians, of course, and also Russians. And uh, it was problematized in such a fast way by media and by, by, uh, by journalists and by artists that uh, trying to do that exploded more or less immediately. So we announced it, I think, three days ago, four days ago, and already it completely exploded. Of course, in the end, you say because of mistakes of communicating, because of this, because of that, because you are, you always know better afterwards, but uh, you just find out that we find ourselves in a situations where the contradictions uh, are so fast moralized, are so fast, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, used in a way and and introduced in a in a in a in a in a medial system that you are lost. So, and you could say that my work is turning around these kind of questions. How can artists and activists from Brazil, from the Amazon, from Europe, from Flanders, from and so on, work together? How can we kind of bring groups together that are so extreme in their differences and in even in their, let's say, interest in the specific project that this kind of, of, of collective is exploding all the time, but still becomes what you could call a choir. So how is this, uh, this working? And the normal answer is let's try to find safe, spa safe spaces. Let's try to be more or less the same, that these problems will not arise, you know, arise in the first place. Yeah. Yes, I think also very interesting in his book, Milo was almost as the French was a cur de cri, a cri de coeur, um, that uh, you say, don't be afraid of contradictions. Really don't, don't fall into that. If you don't have this, you can't do that. Or the moralizing in that, what you say, in the way that stands in the way of creating something. You're going to quote a Pasolini who said, you know, only when I'm deeply um, conflictive, I'm deeply contradictive. I know my work is consequential. Something um, will happen, and I think um, to, to 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 even live with contradictions. This yeah. is this is beautiful. For example, 
a, a really uh, a very well functioning activist action always is super contradictory. So for me, I remember when we were, I, I don't know how much this action is known in, in, in the US, but Pussy Riot, this group in, 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 in Russia, you happened to be there the evening before the famous I was church yeah, concert, right? Yeah, but but many many months before because we did a project and uh, the, the, this group they were playing in all kind of contexts. So they were playing on the Red Square and they were playing in the McDonald's and they were playing and so on, and nothing happened. And then they said, okay, tomorrow we play in the in the in the Holy Savior Cathedral, and everybody was like, okay, yeah, why not? And we, 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 can we can play there too so they did it and it became a huge scandal because putin or medvedev at that moment and then i think putin they used it to to kind of connect the orthodox church to the uh to the state power by saying okay this is western liberal shit we don't want this so they and pussy right said as the Orthodox Church goes together with the, with the state power, and the Orthodox Church was always independent, we invading the church, we are the real saints. And then even the Orthodox intelli intelligentsia was dividing, and one was saying, Pussy writes the real saints, and the other one said, no, they are against the church, because it was disrespectful, it was, uh, it was uh, they invaded the space of the church, and it was completely contradictory. And then we made what we called it Moscow trials, around it so we brought everybody included in this process that two of them were already in the camp and one was still out so we made it together with with her and uh, and other people and uh, it was super interesting to see how so in the sakharov center a civil rights center he created a trial um um you know putting them um, on state really on trial following Again, the procedures of a real trial and again with the with the advocates and with everybody included in the first trial mm -hmm. so it was very interesting to me to see because we formed uh, uh, um, a, a popular jury just out of people from from moscow um, to see how they were completely divided by looking on this action and of course i came from western europe and for me these artists they were right you know and i was against putin etc but then when you looked from the from from all these perspectives on it it was very different and then i found out that this was a it now it became a, con a landmark in art history if you want this 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 concept in the in the in the holy savior cathedral but i found out and i think it's kind of a rule because it was so contradictory because it was aggressive it was invasive it was uh, destroying the safe space of these these believers it was completely i mean for many many points you could criticize them on the other side it was occupying the holy space that was occupied by state power at that very moment when the orthodox uh, i don't know the english word but the the the, the, the chief of all the orthodox uh, um, um, believers in, in 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 russia officially started to support putin so it was it was and 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 that made that project so interesting and still today when you would go to Ra i mean today it's it's of course completely different from 10 years ago but still today when you would go there you would find a division inside the uh, inside the intelligentsia about this uh, about this this uh it crystallized mm -hmm. what was hidden or what people normally maybe not don't want to talk of or think about, but it was already there. We coming closer um, um, to the end, and we will also take some questions. But we couldn't uh, uh, have this talk without talking about the idea of the real, the theater of the real, as Carol Martin says. Um, and um, there is an obsession, of course, in our times with realism, with facts, with data. Um, someone um, said, you know, if you want to look for spiritual meaning, you go to the Wall Street pages of the economy section, and the market will do this, and the market will do that, and almost godlike, you don't know what will happen, but it's all based on data and facts, um, which is uh, somehow a reality. A reality, as you point out in your book, that is without ideas, without vision, with just facts and information. Your idea to turn it around, the idea of a global reality, uh, the poetics of a global reality as a counter model to that I think is also a fundamental, a great contribution to, to the discourse. So tell a little bit, uh, the, what does it mean to you, the idea of, a, as you call, call it, the poetics of a, a global realism? Um, 
it's again connecting uh, people or connecting organizations that are disconnected in the in the in the globalized economy. Um, when, for example, you c I, I talked about the Eastern Congo, when you connect East Congo and Switzerland, and you bring these two realities of, for example, the, the market of raw materials together, so the mines on the one side, and the, on the other side, the big refineries, the banks, and so on, you will find the reality of the system, of the whole reality of the of the raw materials market, because it's, it's not tangible. Um, and I do it by by bringing people together. For example, when we do the Congo Tribunal, we bring together mining workers, m people from the militias, people working in the big companies, NGO workers, people from the UN, lawyers, etc., etc., in one fictional tribunal, which becomes the stage of the world market, but very real, very realistic. Inside, this, uh, the same what we did in the Moscow trials when we were in the Sakharov Centrum, and we did this, this trial, it was extremely real because everybody was there and at the same time it was super surreal because this space doesn't exist because world economy would bring the orthodox people here and pussy right there and the mining workers here and so on and so on. So creating this melting pot and seeing what then this melting pot creates as a rhetoric, as a story, perhaps as a reality, you know, perhaps it becomes law, it becomes an institution, it becomes a new reality. So this is um, what is what is uh, what is global realism, and what we call realism until now uh, was always local realism, and I was al always asking myself, but why information, the market, the climate, the history, that you know, the whole planetary organism is of course glo in a global way rea real, but the rhetorics of the art. For example, for me, in, in Europe, when you go from, from, from Germany to France, and you know it uh, perhaps better than me, you find a completely other theater, you know? You cross just the language border and you come to another system with other classics, other acting style, other... There is no global exchange about this. A bit, but not really. I mean, exchange by, by inviting, you know? So this is... Uh, this is this is this is what I try to do in in in, in bring and I think changing this is only possible by bringing people together or creating institutions that bring these people together to work together that come from all kind of, of, of different places from from the system. Yeah, and I liked very much also what you said. It doesn't has to be real or look real or a copy of a reality. The way of making it, the production, the rehearsals. Uh, the, the making of it um, becomes reality. W when you can demonstrate something, you say, it also shows you can change it because you capture something, you can demonstrate it, and you um, can um, uh, change um, um, something, and it becomes real through the act on stage. And at the very end, s you are a director, so, um, and we, of course, it's a book talk, but all these ideas you have, Ultimately, you are in a rehearsal space. You know, how do you work then with your actors? How do you uh, do you improvise the scene? I know Castor often says, puts a video camera on, says actors improvise that scene. He has like ten days recorded, and then they have to redo what they did, and that's the show. You know, as a radical idea, how do you implement? How do you put these ideas, which I think are remarkable ideas? They are an answer. Perhaps what theater can be and should be, one of many answers, of course, like in a museum, we have many selves. But how do you put it on stage? How do you work with the, your ideas on, 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 on acting, on working with text? Uh, it's a complex question, but what do you think is the, makes Miele Rao different from other directors? Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, it's a different question because it's it's uh, or a difficult question because it's it's um, it's it's very different from from one project to the other. For example, I do I do projects that are happening once, and of course I would there I would have some rules. Everybody knows these rules, and these rules are based in the space. Like in what the are the rules? Yeah, in the Congo Tribunal or in the let's say in this tribunal formats, the rules are the the rules of a, of a fictional tribunal, but everybody who is there is real. And everybody what is said is real, but you only know that you have 10 minutes, for example, for your speech or for this interrogation. 
but you don't know what will be said. But you know perhaps, or the prosecutor knows what he wants to find out, and it happens once. But you also didn't know, you just gave the structure of the trial. Yeah, I, I remember when we did the, the, the Moscow trials and we were judging again Pussy Riot and two were in the camp and one was in my trial and it was not clear if they would be judged again uh, for what they did, you know? Because this popular jury was just like half of them were on Putin's side or not even on Putin's side, they were just against this kind of, 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 of Western liberalism in their eyes. And uh, I, I remember that I was there and I was saying, okay, when now they are judged again in the Sakhov Center, it's closed since then, but which always was the iconic place, you know, of freedom in Russia. And Pussy Riot is judged in that place by me in the Sakhov Center, what have I done? Then I can suicide. And, 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 and this is one way of doing theater, that you're completely panicking and exposed to a a machine that is much bigger than than everybody and um, and uh, and then there are other plays that we in a somehow chaotic way would develop so we when we when we did Antigone and the Amazon it was from 2019 to 2023 um, and it was uh, meetings and uh, working here and there and in the Amazon and uh, rewriting and filming and doing this and that and everybody writing and then somehow bringing it together but then comes the point when you have a touring play and you know you will play it in, in, in i don't know 20 30 countries you have to kind of empower four or five people that are on stage that they really have it in their hands. So it's kind of a psychological acting, in a way you would say. It's um, 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 a, a use of um, stage acting almost as if it is a state theater, or is it different? Um, I think, I mean, in, 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 in the way of acting, I try to always work together with actors that come from very different acting schools. So, or non-actors. And um, for example, now I do in this very moment, I do a play called Medea's Children. And I work with children to stage Medea by Euripides. Because I was always interested by, by the Greek tragedies, but especially by this play. But you know, the, the psychological, I mean, nothing against Euripides, but the psychological level of this play is very low. And, um, but then I was, I was interested in saying, okay, if this is a, a metaphor of, um, you know, because I was, I was the, the sad thing, uh, just very short, then, because it's, it's based on that. I was, the story of Medea is she falls in love and it doesn't turn out to be uh, a good situation for her because Jason, uh, under the influence of Creon, gets another wife and she kills her children and she lost everything behind. She went out of her family to find love and then she become, becomes unhappy. And this is, of course, the story of getting older, no? You leave your family behind, you su try to be happy, but then you don't become happy. I mean, in short. And, uh, and then I was, I, was, I was talking to children, they were saying, you know, Milo, we know um, the best would be if we all would disappear because uh, humanity, the planet, this doesn't uh, fit, so humanity should disappear. But we would propose that we are the last generation, so we live and then we stop it. But we would like to live, we would like to have a career, we would like to have children and love. And uh, I thought, ah, this is interesting. It's a very vitalistic concept of the tragic. You know, so we should do Medea with children because they know exactly what it means to move out of the family. They know exactly what all this is. And, um, and, uh, and then you, you start working with what they tell you and at the same moment they have their ideas of acting, you know. And these ideas are very absurd, of course, often, but also very nice. And uh, so you bring this together and then you have some actors on stage that are real actors in the way that they know to use the space and uh, and you mix it and um, and at one point you find and that was yesterday in this Taylor Mac show 
Um, and what I like very much about this show and what I try to do too is to see how um, a group of people forms a community and they sing or they do Shakespeare or they do Chekhov or they do deconstructing whatever or they just hang around or they play music but that you feel that the, the, the parallel existence of loneliness and of coming together and loneliness of coming together and bringing this space to visibility and share it with the public this is what I think is theater about and I think it's a very very um, successful one. Um, maybe we'll open it up um, to a couple of questions. I will come down and also bring you the mic. First of all, really um, thank you, Milo, for coming and taking the time and answering. And thanks to all our viewers also on HowlRound. Um, <clears throat> so um, anyone um, has a question or a comment? Here we go. So one, two. Um, thanks so much for this uh, rich exchange. I was curious um, uh, to learn more about the dynamic between your writing process and your other work. You know, by definition, at least usually, unless you let AI write your book, it takes a while. You have to uh, really engage with your own thinking, and it's uh, it's a very lonely process for most people, um, which is not what your other work is, which is very dialogically centered. And I'm wondering how you shift gears between a project of writing this book and engaging with your other work do you keep them separate and do you let them connect and is it a fruitful collaboration or is it just a very productive contradiction as you discussed and uh, bringing the dialogical element in i'm curious about your collaboration with your translator um, thank you Um, um, I, I, you know, theater, and I, this is a, perhaps an answer to your question, how to write, because theater is very a very nice work because you always have the premiere. And you know that on the premiere, it has to be theirs, whatever. And, um, and writing for rehearsals is very nice because you know on Saturday at nine starts the rehearsal and then you have to deliver the text. And perhaps you write it at six in the morning on Saturday, you know, but at nine you have to deliver it. And um, I think this idea of delivering <laughs> is uh, is very, very helpful. And it's my, my model for almost everything I do, that I know that this is this is the moment. I mean, this, is, this seems now very practical, but in the end of the day, that's what it is. And the difference between uh, writing and, and improvising is that you are right to say that when you're together with other people to come into the state of acting in the way of not of acting like an actor but acting as like a human being is very simple you know if what i say now would have to write in my room in the hotel would be much more difficult than tell it here and everybody knows that and that's why we are searching for this no this this moments to um, overcome the loneliness and to 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 create and uh, to do it together is very simple to do it alone is is difficult and i think perhaps there are other people and it's the other way around but i always try to transform the the solitude of of writing to a process that is um that is collective so that i know i have to write this because we need this text or we we um and then it goes uh, very fast. And I think the second thing which is super important is uh, uh, is the acceptance of imperfection. That you know that, that you write it like this. That's why I write many books. Because I know this book is okay for now. But in a year uh, I need another one. And in two years it's another one. And um, now the interaction <laughs> with Lily who makes the translation um, is a quite long one since years we we are not on this book but on many uh, topics we are in exchange so um, and uh, sometimes she likes my work and sometimes she criticizes it and uh, I also when I was read because I was reading it now the first time what she was translating I just felt okay I, I have to read it first for myself because reading it out loud was a bit strange 
um, not because it's a bad translation. Of course, it's much better that than what was written in German. So it becomes sense now in English. But it's it's um, um, it becomes in a in a nice way appropriated by Lily. And I feel when I read it, but like every translation, it's now not a, a critique about the concept of translating by Lily. But it's it's just I feel that ah okay that's her perspective that's interesting, and um, um, I I uh, I see it with for example one other dramaturg uh, I'm working together now to translate because my Flemish is very bad, and uh, or more or less non-existent comparing to French or, or German or English even so I would write it in German and she would translate it into Flemish. And while she translates it, I um, I see how she distorts the sense. And often it becomes better, and often I think she loses something. Then we would talk about it. Um, so translating is perhaps a bit like like uh, like improvising on on a on a text or a, I don't know. A, a situation that you would give and you would improvise in that direction or in that direction and it for me is, I mean there's a big theory about translating but for me it was always interesting and even a bit shocking how crazy this process is um, of translating and how different the, the, the outcome can be um, yeah I just wanted to talk for or ask you a little about the idea of institutions, given the the promise that the creative the creation of new institutions. Um, but here you are running another institution in Vienna, and I wonder how are you unpacking it? How are you helping them unpack it? How are how are you living with the structure of that institution, given your desire to? create brand new ones, or to work with brand new ones. I mean, my, my, my experience with Vienna is, is still young. Um, and, and, and perhaps I talk better about, about Ghent, which was um, an institution. We, for reasons a bit unknown, the, the theater of Ghent completely collapsed at one point. Um, because of struggles of the team, because of financing, because of many things. And when I arrive, we always made the joke, it's like Germany 45. So everything is destroyed. And, uh, and it was very nice to build this institution up together with the survivors, but also together with a lot of new people. So this was an institution that was very open to change because it was everything was better than what was there somehow and um, I mean I'm exaggerating to make it a bit shorter but um, at one point um, there's this beautiful quote by Bertolt Brecht he's saying that if there's a city A where you they love me and a city B where they need me I would decide to go to city B and uh, and at one point I, I, I felt that in uh, in this institution everybody would love me and everybody would l love each other, and it was really a super nice way of working. Um, and this was the moment when, when I thought, okay, perhaps now another group of people should see how they can develop it further. We did what we can, and we could now stay for a long time and be, um, yeah, and continue the circle of what we created and arrange it a little bit, but it should. It should change, and now uh, it was, I think, a week ago. There are now new artistic directors, and they are introducing a lot of ideas about working with AI and working with rituals and stuff that I was, I don't know, I, I don't know so much about what they do. And I said, I thought, I, I looked at it and said, so, oh, I'm so happy I went away, because what they do is is completely unforeseen, and I would never have done it, and. Um, and yeah, I think an institution is always stronger and bigger than, and this is nice than than everybody of us. So this is the the the, 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 the crazy thing of it. But at the same time, it's also very nice to see that you come somewhere and you go, and uh, and uh, and you change an institution, and then you 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 somehow leave. Um, 
Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, you know, as a general idea, and I think on the next panel we talk about a lot about institutions because when we talk about institutions, it's the way how our society creates and changes structural um, structures. Actually, it's done into institutions. Just another word for for changing society or maintaining a wrong way of 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 of, uh, of producing art, for example, a wrong way or a good way. But however you do it, you do it in institutions. And I think for a long time I was also obsessed by this kind of avant-garde uh, um, philosophy that you should act outside the institutions, and that the institutions are bad. But I think that I was really wrong. And I think that everybody of us should go into the institutions and change them or not change them. If they are fine, why would you change it? But I think you should w work into inside the institutions. I don't know what is the what is the, the, the meaning of institutions in the in the sector of, of arts and theater here, but in Europe um, they are big, they are strong, they have a lot of money, but they are led by complete idiots. And this is problematic. And um, and um, I mean, it's also a self-critique, of course, because others would say this about me, I know. But um, I think if, if you have enough nice people going into institutions that at least try to change a little bit um, how foreseeable it is what comes out of these institutions, then it's fine. One last, one last one. Hi, uh, I'm currently researching uh, the intersectionality of journalism and theater, and I feel like a lot of your work has has done like with documentary theater with Laura Pries, um, and I was curious about how, with your work, the journalistic inquiry is sort of, if at all, if it's fed into uh, the work that you've done. Um, and I guess this is sort of an aside, but if you see a world in which journalism can be, I suppose, pushed forward by the work that theater can do. I don't know if that makes sense. Journalism? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, when he was saying that I was a journalist, this is a myth. I was never a journalist. And I perhaps because I have <laughs> really a big respect for this, this it's it's a profession, and I never you, you wrote right for Steven yeah, but I was I mean it was more a trick to be uh, con to work on things that I'm interested in. So I was of course doing film and theater and you know reportage in countries I wanted to know, and uh, I was not a real journalist like I would I don't know. For me, real journalism means go to a newspaper, try to transform you know the way how how a newspaper works, you know, and uh, or how is it online, is it printed, what what exactly is it, what does it mean to be a journalist, how engaged are you by, are you doing investigation, do you try to change society through journalism, so, and I always knew that I would do this in theater and in film, because it's just the, the place, it's my place, but I know and I have good friends uh, that are doing what I do in, 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 in film and theater, they do it in journalism, they become, you know, concerned of how is the stuff working in my newspaper. Are we independent from this and from that? How long time do we have to write uh, a reportage? How do we find the money to give to this person because we knew, know he wants to investigate, I don't know, the, the company of Glencore or whatever. So we give this person like three months, four months, five months time like in some crazy idea of the 60s, you know, that you would have all this time. So, and, uh, and, and, and I think these are, I mean, in this, of course, I think the logical allies, for me, it's also the whole institutions of justice that I'm super interested in, then journalism, of course, or media, and the arts. So these are the three sectors that are, I am always trying to, to link because I feel that these are the, the the institutions that change and think and transform uh, 
society by representing, distributing reality, you know, by, by declaring, I don't know, something for interesting or not, for visible or just invisible. And when you, when you would tell a story of the Western mind, um, you would, you could tell it through, you know, important moments of journalism <laughs> somehow. Mom I mean, um, photojournalism, of course, that's the most uh, significant, but you, you, um, and um, yeah, so I think it's a very, it's, it's a very close and it's a bit by, by decided by the accidents of your character where you, where you would start to, to act. A very last short, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Susan Buck Morris and I was involved in one of your projects during, uh, during COVID. Uh, and I just want to ask you, when one sees so much of politics today, politics rather than art, that is performance, and even legal performances, including this very moving uh, way that South Africa has made a claim on the world court, how would you, how do you think about the difference between the performance of politics uh, in a different sense from the performance of art. There was there was a I, when when I was listening to you, I was thinking about one anecdote of the Moscow trials because the the um, the advocate of Pussy Riot in my fake trial was of course the advocate of the real trial of Pussy Riot, and she lost the real trial. And I remember when I was close to lose again the trial but now the fake trial and it was the same advocate and i saw that if this would happen this is really tragic and in the in the beginning of the trial there was uh, a journalist coming i think it was masha gessen from the from the us and she was there and she was asking her but why would you do this fake trial this theatrical trial she said when you did a real trial and she said you know what this is the first trial that is absolutely not theatrical for me. This is real. But what I do in politics or what I do in, in Russian justice, this is theater. And perhaps the role of art is to de-theatralize, if this word exists, reality, you know? Um, um, and to conf confront it in, in, in what it is and to change it. Because, uh, I mean, there's this beautiful quote of uh, change everything so that nothing is changed, no? From Il Gatto Pardo, from this novel. So the conservative mind talk all the time about change, but don't change anything. And this is the theater of politics, no? And to find a basic way of real change, of real representation, of real justice, of real being together and beauty and all these kind of things, but also of real sadness and of real melancholy. So to stop perhaps the theater of, of, of being and to confront the fact of dying. For example, I made many plays that are about the fact of dying. It seems a bit, a bit old style to do so, but you know, um, and, uh, and I think that's what art should do and what theater should do. And what of course journalism should do or what justice should do. Um, So really, um, again, thank you all for coming, taking time out. But I think really um, our um, thanks and uh, for Mila for taking the time and uh, taking this so serious and for answering. And I think you really make a great and very significant contribution. The chorus also, you know, of world theater makers, global theater makers, you are part of it. A lot of people talk about the community. You say we have to bring them in. It means they are not part of it. You are part of it. And through you, we also are. So it means the world to us. And thank you all for coming. At 6.30, we talk about what he called Beyond the 2%, the incredible small representation of women composers and musicians on the stages in Europe, especially. And at 8 o'clock, Mila will show four or five of the trailers of work he talked about and then get a little bit more into detail. And also, I think it will help us to visualize and to see because so very few, I think one show has come here. So, um, so in case you can come back at eight. Thank you. And again, Milo, thank you.